Welcome, everyone. Uh, again, uh, I happen to be uh, Chair 134, which is, for those that aren't aware, it's a relatively new uh, committee. And I'll be discussing the genesis of it as we, as we evolve into the presentation and, and some of the things that we do. Um, and I, I will be talking about some, some uh, examples of, of why constructability is important, uh, why early collaboration is important between the owner, the designers, the construction expertise is necessary to make an efficient and cost-effective uh, result. Uh, broken into uh, six different uh, categories, definition of constructability, barriers to constructability, examples of non-constructible conflicts, genesis of the 134 committee on, on constructability, format and methods of communication, and then I'll summarize the, the talk. So that's basically the essence of what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, <clears throat> This is a definition that we produced at committee level, and, and it was balloted, and we went through a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, ideas on what we wanted to, uh, to, to, to uh, for a definition, but ultimately the definition, and I'll read it out just so it's, it's clear, the effective and timely integration of concrete construction knowledge into the planning, design, and construction of a project to achieve the overall objectives with the goal of optimizing time, safety, and cost while maintaining the target level of quality. So that's what we decided as, as a group, and that, that was our definition, and that's what we have on our website and what we've, we've, we've put in. Uh, if you go on to, uh, I did a couple of Google searches and whatever, and, and if you look at Wikipedia, they have a definition for constructability, uh, and they denote uh, some of the things they bring up are ease of construction with the optimal use of construction knowledge and planning, design, procurement, and field operation. Again, ease of construction is a, is a thing that is very important to, to consider there. Um, this is, uh, this is a definition of constructability in the uh, International uh, Concrete Repair Institute, and, and they have a little section there in, in that. And uh, there, some of their key points is, is the design workable? Will the application technique allow for putting installation in service within the time specified? And is the working environment conducive to the application method specified and are experienced tradespeople available for the specified application method. There's a resource requirement too. You, you have to think about these kind of things as you're going through it. Um, <coughs> the other, uh, I had uh, construction processes have evolved in, in contractual perspectives from what was the original design bid project where everyone worked in a silo and you delivered it and by some magic you expect that the owner is going to get what he wants out of that. Um, then they've, we've morphed into design build and we've design, morphed into construction management and construction management at risk and a bunch of other things where people become more and more engaged and involved and share in the benefits of what you might have but maybe it's a better process, and it's a process that, that, that you're trying to get so that people can work towards a common goal and they all have an ownership of it. Um, you've probably seen this, this uh, graph in all sorts of different uh, uh, styles and, and, and functions, but basically it's saying early involvement by the construction team optimizes the resources and solutions for a cost-effective project. And as you can see, the, uh, the benefit is on the, on the uh, x-axis is, is the earlier you can get involved with, with adjusting and modifying and changing the project or, or bringing it in with all the players, the most benefit that you're going to get. And that's the conceptual planning stage. The, the, the net thing is that you start at, at startup 
a lot of this stuff's been done and you can't undo things. So you are now not going to get the cost benefit and your, your returns are going to be low. So, so that's an important aspect of it and this has been used all over all kinds of things, but it, plan it, think it out, get it going before you start the project and you, and you do it. And that's where you're going to get the most benefit. So I, I wanted to bring that up. Um, trying to put a project together by a patchwork process of unilateral fixes and changes without the proper pre-construction uh, use, use readily using re readily available materials and resources and using collective knowledge of the whole project team, you're going to end up with something that probably isn't what you expected was going to be and definitely not what the owner wanted to get in the first place too, right? And also good, good leadership and a positive atti attitude make for productive work by all players. So I, when I first started uh, with the uh, company where I spent most of my career at, uh, Ellis Dawn in Toronto, um, I, I was, had the privilege of working on the Sky Dome and I set up the precast plant for the Sky Dome and we did a whole bunch of stuff on that. But I, I have to say that one of the most influential people I've ever run into was project manager from the owner's rep for, uh, for Stadco is what it was called at the time. His name was uh, Chuck Magwood. And he had a regular thing that he would meet with all the players. Got a big boardroom, everyone sat around, and that's from, from the designers to the contractors to the subs and whatever else. And he'd usually come in with a box. And, and so he'd, he'd put the box down on the table and he'd go, and he had little ball caps with a slogan. And it was, we're going to do this together. So why that? Well, we get everyone together. We're all sitting under the same cap. And, and he really developed that team structure very, very well. And that's, that's a key part of what all this stuff is, is we're, we're you don't build a job without people. <laughs> And you have to get the people involved and, and feel like they have some involvement in the project and that they're all trying to do a good job. And, and we really were. Everyone was so productive on that job and really looking to, to gain the end result. So it was a really good situation. And so you don't get, end up with a, <laughs> a blob that <laughs> you, end up, you end up doing, right? Um, there's a lot of, it's a little bit messy, but uh, I didn't have my, uh, all my software when I was down in Mexico trying to do this project, so. <laughs> but what, what, what anyways, the essence is that there's a bunch of, a lot of times, especially in new, you find in, in, in specifications now where we're morphing between um, uh, prescriptive and performance. And, it's, it's sort of a thing that I guess, I guess <laughs> there's, a, there's a sort of hybrid that's, that's built right now where you've got someone telling you that they want to achieve a certain performance per, uh, per, property, but then they're going to say, but you're going to do it with limiting the amount of fly ash or you've got so much cement content you've got and you've got to have this slump and whatever else. And then you're saying, well, hold it, you've taken all my tools away. I can't do anything with this. So, so th there is a big issue with, with documents on that, and those of us that have been around and done enough work, we know that, that it, it is a big issue, and that's, that's the thing we have to fix. Um, uh, example, here, here was a, here's an example of, of uh, there's a limitation on, on uh, stripping shores between a, a Construction, uh, uh, construction joint, and and they're saying tw you can't strip this until you've got 28 day strength, and 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 that's what they've tied. But they haven't given the option to the constructor or to the engineering or whatever else to say that maybe we can look at a solution that's going to like increase the strength or a little bit more rebar or something in that joint that's going to transfer the load that would give us the opportunity to be able to strip out the forms earlier 
and not tie up this whole area, usually it's all the way up the building in, a, in an expansion joint or something, that, that you can't do any work at because you're, you've got a whole bunch of reshores and everything in place. So that's a thing that, that you see in there and it doesn't give the latitude to, to have an option. Um, we always are tied by what resources we have. So, low, so uh, this is a, a little graph or chart I pull, pulled up, but land meaning includes any natural resources that you may have in the area. So it, it's local, locally uh, driven. So you may be in, in, in the central part of, of the United States, Midwest or something, and, and they may be asking for, a, for, for example, slag or something that, that, that you don't have any steel making in that location and then you can't get it. Or they may be asking for, for, for a product, a uh, certain type of cement that you have to, dr you have to bring in from, from uh, Europe or some other place because it's not locally made. So you've got to make sure that, in fact, the resources, when you're speci specifying something and asking for something, that they are available. And that also the, the, uh, the capacity for the people, the subcontractors or the people building it, that they have the facilities to be able to do this. Um, sometimes you ask for a whole bunch of different blends of products and, and, and you've only got a, a, a series of uh, ready mix plants, for instance, that may have two silos. They can handle fly ash maybe and they can ha handle cement and that's it. And, and you can go with, with trying to create some exotic mix or some other thing, they can't do it. So you're gonna have to try to scale back a little bit what we want. Uh, labor, obviously, you're, you're, you need a skilled set of people to, to be able to do what you're doing and, and make sure that it's within the limitations of what that group are. You need the capital to do the work, the equipment, the machinery, and you need the entrepreneurship and you have to allow the entrepreneurs to be able to be innovative. A um, couple of examples we have of, of a rebar congestion that, that give us problems. This, um, this was a project that we did that had a really neat uh, Area where where the central area of the of the building was under the under the, the uh, below grade, and it was a big wide open space. 500 people could could sit there at one time for for uh, for their uh, uh, lectures, but it required a, a, a special uh, perimeter, special ring beam, flat. Uh, basically fit into, into perimeter walls that then would transfer the load. And then at the top, there was a, there was a secondary structure that, that uh, spanned the, the roof and, and was able to pr uh, provide that. Um, this is sort of a, a drawing of, of what it was. And, and we've got two sections. We've got, it basically went in two pores. So the, the bottom part, um, the ring uh, hexagon supporting the, 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 the beams created a heavily reinforced uh, tie structure. Oops, sorry. There. Um, yeah, here. Here, these were in the bottom section here, supporting the first phase of the, of the, of the pore for the, for the ring beam. And then, it was framed into the perimeter here, so they tied into this ring beam structure around here. And the interface there was so that it, with the, with the supporting beams, you needed a high amount of steel. Uh, originally, it was planned to be uh, cast uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, conventionally vibrated concrete. It became apparent that with the, the spacing of the rebar and whatever else, if I go through my, my table to determine the size of the, the uh, vibrators I need and the productivity rate that they're gonna go, it would have been in the order of, of uh, 30 to 50 vibrators would be needed to pour, to, to be able to handle at the placing rate of 100 meters an hour is what we plan. So that obviously didn't work. <laughs> And so, so we were able to utilize SEC, and luckily enough, 
we were able to use, we were able to pour, um, sorry, Jeez. Uh, within the re ring ring structure, which was more lightly reinforced, and then flow the, the SCC into the, into the, the tide and just bring it up as a level. And that did work, but um, it, it at least gave us a latitude. Because you see that you can see the, the spacing of the of the reinforcing steel and stuff and everything, and it was just to the point that you physically couldn't get the vibrators in there. You couldn't see what you're doing, and it was it was a big issue. Um, ultimately, it ended up working out pretty well. Another another instance here is is uh, what we have is a high rise building that at the bottom. At the bottom area here, very uniform, not a lot of openings, not a lot of different uh, stuff happening. But as we get up above grade, there start to be stepbacks in the in the in the, the core structure. And with the stepbacks, there were a series of horizontal bars that were tying the the setback into the into the residual structure that was coming up above, in order to to maintain the structural integrity of the bit of the uh, of the uh, core, and also we had a whole bunch of openings now because we had all the elevators and access ports, whatever else. So now this created a complexity that wasn't a, wasn't evident down below. Um, it wasn't properly th thought about what's going to happen to this because they were we were pouring three and a half meters or 12, 14 feet or whatever dropping from up above with SCC onto the into the into the structure. But but what what happens as you're doing that, there there's our lift and we're pouring down we're pouring down here. What's what's happening is that we've got to flow the concrete underneath there. We've also got these these beam these uh, transverse bars, horizontal bars that are a barrier. For the concrete to drop up, but you're pouring in three or four lifts, so as you drop it, the the concrete or the the rocks or whatever settle on that layer of bars, and then you come back again, and then you pour the next lift, and it settles more. And what you do is you create a barrier, and that's what ended up happening. And and so that obviously is a thing if you can. There we go. If you if you can, there we go. If you can uh, understand that this may happen down the road and there's something different, then then that's that's where the importance of understanding a job beforehand, building it before you even start cutting the the ground and seeing what differences are there. Uh, evolution of ACI 134. Our moderator happens to uh, be quite involved in that. He's also known as Bruce Supernaut. And uh, he was involved in uh, 2016, Bruce, I think that's correct, with, with uh, TAC and in, with CLC. And they decided yeah, that ACI needs to have a, a format and a, and a group that, that's able to do this. So he was a, he he initiated along with other people the stu the synthesis of ACI 134. Uh, it was uh, started in TAC in in uh, in uh, 2000 and uh, and and uh, 16. Sorry, yeah, 2016, and then in 2017 uh, we started out with the first meetings of the of the group. And uh, and uh, Jim Cornell was the first first uh, uh, chairperson, and uh, so that that's where we started out with the with the uh, group. But it was it was under the direction of, of people that you're we just talked about. Um, just okay. So what 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 do we do? Well, so so we've had to develop what what is our what is our lot in life. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to create an awareness. 
that, that there, there is a process and it is important to do something that is, is efficient, is cost effective, and is buildable. And so what we, we, we are doing is we're starting out by having uh, regular sessions on specific topics that we're trying to present in our, in our, uh, in our, uh, uh, at ACI conventions. And so uh, this is an example of one we're doing for Boston, which is on prescriptive versus performance and what's going on there and what limitations there are. And we've got a number of speakers on that. Um, we also do mini sessions and we've been doing those for the last five or six conventions and it's hot topics. It's things that are coming up, things that are changing, things that are evolving. And, and we regular do that in our meeting, which is, is going to start shortly. And uh, that's, that's another thing that we try to do to, to bring the awareness. And we, to tell you what's, what's happening, typically we've had over the last, I've been monitoring, monitoring it, we've had between 80 and 120 people attending these sessions on a regular basis. So it's getting the information out there and that's, that's helping. There's also uh, ASCC has set up a constructability group too with a number of people on 134, Bruce and, and whatever else. And it's also trying to get that awareness out to there and bring it into the, into the mainstream where everyone thinks about constructability when they're actually going to be doing their, their uh, project and it makes sense. Uh, they produced uh, uh, an article in, in Concrete International in uh, December 22 is ed edition on, on uh, conflicts with reinforcing and congestion and have a whole bunch of really great ideas on what to do, how to, how to affect it, how to benefit, how to make sure that in fact you can overcome some of the limitations that may be built in, but make it so it's buildable. And it's a really good one to look at. Uh, if, if you have time, you should look at it. Um, the, the conclusion was the emphasis was placed on the designer to design a detail to reinforce concrete structure so the contractor and subcontractors can build them as easy and economically possible. And with that, just make sure it's, you don't design something that's too difficult. If I told you it's better to keep things simple, would you do it? And remember that. Thank you.